Hey guys, over this last month, we've seen some movies that have done a better job of presenting the Christmas spirit than others, but today, we're going to look at something which completely misses the point. The Legend of Frosty the Snowman. There are many iconic characters connected with Christmas, and they're going to be rewritten and reimagined by many different storytellers long after we've passed on. That's all well and good, so long as the core of that character is maintained. But when you write a story that has nothing to do with that character and you haphazardly toss him into it without catering to the character or his legacy in any way whatsoever, you get a festering load of crap that only makes the audience facepalm in a fit of, what the hell were they thinking? That's where the legend of Frosty the Snowman comes in. You remember the story of Frosty, don't you? A little girl builds a snowman and brings him to life, they become friends, and she risks life and limb getting him to the North Pole before he melts, where he lived happily ever after with Santa Claus. This movie opens with Burt Reynolds showing us that Frosty's magic hat is locked up in a trunk. The disappointing answer of why it's locked in a trunk will come soon enough, but what I want to know is, how is it now perfectly capable of escaping when it apparently couldn't before? It is said that Frosty the Snowman always goes where he is needed most. No one ever said that in the history of ever. And right now, no one needs Frosty more than a boy named Tommy Tinkerton in a town called Evergreen. One might think that Karen would need him more, since we haven't seen her since the first Frosty movie, but that's fine. Some random kid who's never even heard of Frosty needs him more, I guess. You then meet Tommy's dad, the mayor, who is such a perfectionist that he pressures flowers into looking their best, even though they're in the middle of winter. Because if there's one thing that needs to be in a Frosty movie, it's fighting off the oppression of Tim Burton's conformist suburbia. No, I'm serious. That's the plot of the movie. Frosty the Snowman is rebelling against the establishment in a town that looks like it's afraid that any day now, the Reds are going to drop the bomb on it. Merry Christmas? Come on, buddy. Be a team player. Atta boy! And he just kills it. Nice. By the way, what was the point of getting Burt Reynolds to tell the story if they didn't even try to make him look like Burt Reynolds? Frosty the Snowman was narrated by Jimmy Durante, and he looks like Jimmy Durante. Frosty's Winter Wonderland was narrated by Andy Griffith, and he looks like Andy Griffith. Frosty Returns was narrated by Jonathan Winters, and even that pile of Charlie Brown ripoffery made him look like Jonathan Winters. Why did they make this narrator look like Geppetto? Anyway, Mayor stick up his butt sends his kids off to school when this happens. Keep it moving, people! <laughs> the very obvious moral here is that the slightest variation outside the norm results in complete and utter chaos. I know we're supposed to be against this rigid conformity, but the movie here is saying that we need it or else the world will explode. And even when the world is exploding, for the love of God, do not step out of line! But if there's one thing that life has taught me, it's that there are no accidents. That puddle in the sidewalk over there was actually planted by the communists. There are no accidents. There are no accidents, huh? I suppose that's the movie's attempt at shrugging off any and all criticism. It intended to suck, so it's okay! Then the hat lands on the inexplicable golden statue of the mayor? Shouldn't that suddenly spring to life? HAPPY BIRTHDAY! Sorry, but since when was the magic hat alive? If it's sentient and can do whatever it wants, why wouldn't it just go back to Frosty whenever he loses it? Then again, since the major theme of this movie is breaking the rules for no reason, I guess arbitrarily ignoring Frosty lore is perfectly acceptable here. After some painful kids' movie cliches, like the principal who's straight out of the Third Reich, and the main character's would-be love interest with no other purpose than to be a would-be love interest, the kids go home after school where we get even more confirmation that, yes indeed, this town is all about conformity. When I was a girl, do you know what my favorite after-school activity was? I don't know. Cleaning the house, staying in the kitchen, making babies. Stop me if I get it. Having mother brush my hair. And with long sweeping strokes do we brush. Brush! You see, Sarah, every girl is a princess. And her hair is her crown. But I don't want to be a princess. 
I want to be an urban planner. I swear you get this from your father's side. Damn you, ambition! Later at Tommy's house. Question one. Your salad and soup course are presented at the same time. Set salad aside. Three o'clock. Using soup spoon, largest on the table. Move soup in counterclockwise motions to cool. Never blow, never slurp, never set soiled spoon on tablecloth. Wait until others have finished before moving on to the salad course. Ooh, look out! Which foods are appropriate to eat with one's fingers? Artichokes, asparagus, or gerbs? Crudite, crepes, cocktail wieners, olives, pickles, nuts, deviled eggs, chips! Yes, 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 yes! We have a winner! Even people who have never seen the 50s know that this isn't what it was like. What are you doing here, movie? Victory lap around the hood? What do you say? Just you, me, and the clipboard. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah! After they're done not eating dinner, Frosty reveals himself to Tommy. So, the magic hat can make Frosty the water vapor, as well as a tiny version of itself? Keep it coming, movie. You're only making the original Frosty less impossible. And what's Tommy's reaction to seeing this tiny snowman materialize on his window? I can't. I already let my dad down once today. I just can't. Yeah. That's it. No high-pitched screaming, no begging to keep his immortal soul, no wetting of the pants, just... I already let my dad down once today. Well, I just can't. The believability of this movie is off the charts. Since the hat can't do horrible things to Tommy, he goes over to his friend Walter's house. <gasps> Who's there? Aha! Uh -huh, no answer. And so what do you do now, Walter? Uh, he opened the door and hit him with the vegetables. These are not vegetables, Walter. This is corn. Corn is a starch. Uh, you open the door and hit him with the starch? Absolutely not. So I don't open the door at all? You do not. And so what do I do with the starch? You put it away in the pantry. I put it away in the pantry. You can rinse those dinner dishes while you're in there, Walter. Mm. Rinse the dinner dishes. That not hitting someone with corn scene lasted 58 seconds when it'd be all too easy to simply cut to the hat looking in on Walter washing the dishes. This movie was animated at 12 frames per second, meaning that they just wasted about 700 frames of animation doing absolutely f**k all. When you get to the point, movie, feel free to let us know. <gasps> Who are you and what do you want? Cheese and crackers, why is no one reacting to this thing like real people might? What's the point of making this kid incredibly nervous and not have him scream for his life right now? How are you doing this? I don't see any strings. <laughs> Walter! Where are you going? Holy sh! Walter, you're flying! After crashing into the snow in the middle of the woods, Walter arbitrarily puts the hat on the impact. And why does Frosty need to be rebuilt? Ignoring the fact that he should have been living with Santa Claus, didn't this movie establish that he can just pop out of the hat? Happy birthday! Oh, f you! I know that Jackie Vernon was almost 20 years dead by the time this movie was made, but wow, they didn't even try to get someone to sound like the original Frosty. Hey, who should we get to play this iconic character? I know, let's get the guy who played Patrick from Spongebob. That'll sound endearing, won't it? I swear, every line of dialogue might as well be duh, duh. And let's compare Frosties for a minute. The original Frosty came to life, and all he wanted to do was sing and dance with the kids. This Frosty comes to life, and he immediately takes off his head for shock value and starts pelting this little kid with snowballs. But I'm, I'm not, I'm not even wearing my helmet, and my, and my, my mother says I can't afford another head injury. Hey, that didn't even hurt. Yes, it did. If it's big enough and thrown hard enough to knock you on your ass, it's gonna hurt. 
Thankfully, this playtime doesn't last forever, and Frosty takes Walter home. Well, uh, well I guess I better, um, head in inside now. Uh, no, it's just that, um, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little scared. Scared? Scared of what? Uh, my mother. Why? Is she covered in hair? Does she have long fangs or terrible claws? <laughs> no, she's just a lady. Are you sure you don't mean it? She's just a lady! Oh, well, just a lady doesn't sound so scary. Huh. Ugh. Don't give Frosty his crooked Rankin Bass smile if you're not going to make the rest of the movie look Rankin Bass. It just looks weird. Now that Walter has been turned into a rebel without a point, Frosty goes off in search of someone else to play with. One down. The rest of Evergreen to go. What the hell does that mean? Since when did you go around changing people into something they aren't? Wait a minute. It all started with that puddle. That upset the establishment. He's changed Walter so that he's completely fearless. And now he's going to bring chaos to the rest of the town? He's Loki the Snowman! Word gets out of Walter breaking curfew, which means he's doomed to wear the cursed dunce cap of shame. And for some reason, the mayor had to do this. Because it's not like he has an entire town to manage. Let's direct our attention back to the board, please. Good lord, now Frosty's infecting their sanity! He is going to take over the entire town! After school, we see Frosty help Sarah steal the mayor's hood ornament. Which is such a liberating experience that she has to let her hair down to show us how she's a free spirit. This movie is making a dangerous blurring of the lines between free spirit and criminal. Tommy chases her down, and never once does he try to get his dad's hood ornament back from her, and eventually follows her to this little evergreen model she made out of snow. When did she have time to do all this? It didn't snow until yesterday. She ditches him and leaves Tommy alone with the hat. So all that Frosty had to do to get to Tommy was just wait a day? What was the point of this little deviation with Walter, or Sarah for that matter? We're a third into the movie, and so far, nothing that has happened has been important. Anyway, the hat leads Tommy to the public library, where he finds a secret basement hiding away a secret comic book outlining Frosty's secret origin story. The secret and never-ending adventures of Frosty the Snowman? Okay, seriously, what the f*** is happening here? In-universe, Frosty the Snowman is a work of fiction? How the hell is he real if he's just a comic book character? Once upon a time, there was a boy who didn't believe in magic. Ironically, his father was a magician. The boy believed that real magic, the stuff you can't explain, did not exist. And then one day, when the boy was running an errand for his father, something amazing happened. Happy birthday! So the movie wants to be so indicative of the 1950s, that it wants to perpetuate the idea that women aren't really people, so it completely ignores the original story of Frosty being built by Karen, and instead it insists that he was built by the son of Professor Hinkle. I hope you're proud of yourself, movie. As if that wasn't confusing or frustrating enough, the rest of the comic is blank because Frosty's story has yet to come to its end. Frosty the Snowman is not the never-ending story! You okay, Dad? <laughs> Just a little antsy, I suppose. Some of the kids have been giving your old man an awful case of the good griefs. Your brother's one of them. Food fighting, breaking curfew, and now some nonsense about a magical snowman. Jeez Louise, where did I go wrong? Seems like every kid in town is breaking the rules. But not you, Tomo. I want you to have this pin. You're number one now. Oh, just give the pin to the clipboard. We know it's your favorite child. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have you. Always right there beside me, helping me keep things straight. 
That's okay, Dad. Oh, I... I was talking to the clipboard, son. Oh. While that nonsense is going on, Frosty plays with Walter and Tommy's brother, Charlie. Remember, he can be in two places at once, since he has the power to clone himself, apparently. Happy birthday! Later that night, Frosty meets Sarah face to face, then he turns a couple of icicles into ice skates. When did Frosty ever have the power to turn icicles into ice skates? When did he get Jack Frost's freezing powers? He didn't have those powers in the first movie, he didn't have powers in Frosty's Winter Wonderland, he didn't have powers in Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas in July, he didn't have powers in Frosty Returns, WHAT THE HELL ARE THEY BASING THIS ON?! This is clearly supposed to be Reagan Bass's Frosty that you're ripping off, so the audience had to have seen that movie if they wanted to check this one out. Why are they making this Frosty so different from the Frosty that we all know and love? The next day at school, the kids who are in the know decide to form the Secret Society of Frosty. It won't be long before they start serving Kool-Aid. But its most important member was still missing. Then he can't be the most important member, can he? Later, Tommy finds his mother in the middle of scrapbooking when she should be making her man a sandwich. Huh? Mom? Who's this? Why, that's your father when he was your age, playing with your grandfather's hat. He was a magician, you know. So this movie now wants to focus on this super anal retentive father rediscovering his long lost childhood through the magic of Frosty? So far, every other character is more important than the most important character! The next morning, we see that just by sheer force of will, the mayor is able to make the sun rise. Since Frosty is clearly the reincarnation of Loki, I guess we're left to assume that the mayor is raw? Morning paper in the post box? Check a Rooney. Snow drifts safely below regulation height? Check! I don't understand. What is this, f***ing Footloose? What does this have to do with Frosty the Snowman? What is even happening right now? A few kids misbehave and somehow that makes the entire town go nuts? I guess the Joker should have used a snowman instead of explosives. Here, Frosty. Over here. It's your old pal, Walter. Hey, choose me. Choose me. Walter, I need to talk to you. Go away. No, 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 not you. Come back. What do you want? I want to show you something. It's about Frosty. And my dad. It's about the whole town. My god. I just realized something. This is not a Frosty story. Nor is Frosty a reincarnation of Loki. He's Stephen King's IT! No, really, think about it. Some strange, otherworldly creature comes into town years ago, screws around with some kids, leaves clues about his history that the next generation finds out about, and then he starts stalking them? It's IT! Frosty is IT! Hey there, Tommy! Have a balloon! HAPPY BIRTHDAY! <laughs> Since the entire town is falling to ruin, the mayor starts to doubt if he's right for the job. Your car's been vandalized, the grounds are unkempt, your children won't listen to you. Do you really think you're still up to the job? <sighs> For the first time in a long time, Mr. Tinkerton wasn't sure he had the answer. And when you don't have the answers, well, that's when there's room for wonderful things to happen. Yes, like panic, madness, and chaos! But his wife, bless her heart, is doing all that she can to cheer him up. La 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 clipboard la 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 Frosty crashes on Sarah's little snow city, and you'd think maybe this would be a turning point for the kids, like maybe they learn that fun is fun, but you can't be completely reckless or else bad things happen. But no, Frosty just magically makes it all better because screw consequences, this is a kids movie! We can't give the kids anything of value, can we? That's evergreen the way I see it. Or the way I'd wish it was, if wishing weren't against the rules. One. How exactly does one regulate wishing? Two, your idealized evergreen has some buildings that are slightly taller. 
Dream big, kid. This is beautiful, Sarah. And the best part is, the only thing you need to complete your vision is right here. Oh, Frosty. No, literally, it's right here in my chest cavity. Oh. Because being a retelling of it wasn't disturbing enough, let's turn this movie into Temple of Doom while we're at it. Kalima! Now who wants to catch some snow? Uh, bullshit! I don't care how magical you are, an avalanche is not a tidal wave! Those kids are dead! And so are their dreams of slightly taller buildings, what a shame. It felt like a new day for the children of Evergreen. But the darkest hour often comes directly after having seen the light. No, what you were supposed to say is, it's always darkest just before the dawn. That is inspiring and hopeful. What you just said is that there's no point in hoping for anything ever. The principal bumps into Walter, who's all bummed out that he's not the only kid Frosty wants to hang out with, and he sets it up so that he and Frosty can have a little private playtime after dark. Yeah, nothing creepy about that. And he seems awfully nonchalant about the existence of this magical talking snowman. How deep does this Frosty conspiracy go? Then he holds a town meeting to discuss the evil delinquency caused by rock and roll- uh, I mean Frosty the Snowman. As of tonight, I will be stepping in for Mr. Tinkerton in managing both the crisis situation and the town of Evergreen. And I assure you, you will never hear the words, Frosty the Snowman, again! As the principal of the elementary school, I can assume all responsibilities of the mayor completely unopposed whenever I deem it necessary. That's how public office works, right? After martial law is declared, Tommy reads some new pages in the comic book that weren't there before. Boy spent the rest of the winter looking for proof that Frosty the Snowman really did exist, but he never found any. But what the boy didn't know was that Frosty was looking for him too. But someone who was jealous of the boy had captured Frosty's head and locked it away. <laughs> Principal Pinkley! But the wind has a way of stirring things up. The boy was a man now. And if he did not find his way back to Frosty and restore his faith in magic, the others would turn his world into an ugly place. Oh no! He's gonna make the town exactly like it was before! Ah! Seriously, if Pankley succeeds in his evil plan, all that'll happen is that the town will switch puppeteers. It'll still be just as fascist as ever. And if the whole point of Frosty returning from the grave was so that the mayor's faith in magic would be restored, which has what to do with him personally or as a public official, why not just seek him out to begin with instead of infecting the town with his madness? Oh no, Frosty's dead, I guess. What makes you think this is going to hurt him in any way? Now that Pankley has the hat and the entire town in his pocket, he is on top of the world. <clears throat> Principal Pankley. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mayor Pankley. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm sorry. General Principal Mayor Pankley. <clears throat> uh, Supreme Master Grand Dragon Pankley? <clears throat> Top Super Duper Maxi Extreme Ultra Pankley? <laughs> God? Thank you, thank you. Mr. Tinkerton has passed the clipboard to me. I am now your leader. Children are to follow the rules. Parents 
are to ask no questions. And Evergreen shall do only what Pankley says. Pankley says stand up. Pankley says touch your heads. Pankley says hop on one foot. Bob Show says, where the hell are the cops in this town? Later that night, Tommy gathers his friends to get the hat back, which is apparently out on display where it could easily escape or be stolen by anyone who happens by. Seriously, the guy had it locked up in half a dozen boxes. How is this going to keep it in place? Wow. Property of Theodore Tinkerton. No. If that hat belongs to anybody, it's Professor Hinkle. Now that the hat is back in the kids' hands, they throw together a new snowman for the hat to possess, because I guess it just forgot how to make snowmen on its own. And I don't know about you, but seeing three big snowballs stacked on top of each other really makes me appreciate the craftsmanship that went into the snowman that Karen and her friends built, you know? The rest of the town now sees that Frosty was never a threat to their kids, although I do question why they're suddenly okay with their kids singing and dancing and violating curfew, and Tommy reintroduces his dad to Frosty. Is that really you? Man, you got old, huh? I thought I'd made you up. <laughs> what took you so long? I hit a little detour along the way. Yeah, I just realized something. The hat has been locked away for decades. Not only did the original Frosty movie never happen, but neither did any of the others. Frosty the Snowman didn't happen. Frosty's Winter Wonderland didn't happen. Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas in July didn't happen. This story is clearly ripping off the Rankin Bass Frosty, while at the same time completely destroying everything that came before it. F*** you, movie. Principal Pankley, I believe you have something that doesn't belong to you anymore. The hat? Fine. You take it. I'm done with it. I'm not a hat guy. No. The clipboard. Really? You're not pissed off at him for stealing your friend or completely robbing you of your childlike sense of awe and wonder? It's all about getting the clipboard back. I hope that thing gives you a splinter and you somehow die from the infection. And so the story graciously comes to an end as they all have a friendly snowball fight. Pinkley falls into the thin ice himself and eventually died of hypothermia, I guess. And Frosty just disappears without any mention of whether he melted, he got picked up by Santa Claus, or if he just got high and wandered off. Tommy grew up to have everything he ever wanted. Take it from me because, well, I happen to know Tommy Tinkerton pretty darn well. Thomas! Come in from the cold! You'll catch your death! Coming, Sarah! I'm coming! Yep. That's what the steaming pile of snowman shit was building up to. The kid who couldn't ask out the girl he was mildly interested in was given the confidence to ask her out by having absolutely no interaction with a magical snowman whatsoever. What. A. Load. And why is Sarah living way out here? Didn't she want to be an urban developer? I guess she just gave up on her dreams so she could be with Tommy, just like a good girl is supposed to do. So that was the legend of Frosty the Snowman, and there was nothing Frosty or legendary about it in the slightest. This has to be the most confused Christmas story I've ever seen in my life. We've seen movies using Christmas as a selling point, or maybe they get the message a little garbled up, but never have I seen a Christmas movie that missed the mark this badly. Frosty the Snowman is supposed to be a playmate for the children who built him, not some anti-establishment super hippie trying to enrich the lives of those who need him most. The stories of Frosty and Tommy had nothing to do with each other. This movie has so little to do with Frosty, they didn't even include his theme song except for in the credits. Tommy, despite the movie insisting that he's the most important character, did nothing of value that no one else could do themselves. He's so unimportant that he and Frosty never even share any dialogue. And no, him talking to the hat doesn't count. Admittedly, I am kind of curious as to how this super paranoid society lived on since the 50s were over, but if that's the story you want to tell, don't involve Frosty the Snowman! So, while we condemn this movie to the fate that it deserves, let me assure you that while you and I will spend many a Christmas together, this movie will not be back again someday. Happy 
birthday. Frosty the snowman was a jolly happy soul. With a corn cup pipe and a button nose and two eyes made out of coal. Frosty the snowman is a fairy tale they say. He was made of snow, but the children know how he came to life one day. There must have been some magic in that old silk hat they found. Oh, when they placed it on his head, he began to dance around. Frosty the snowman. Subscribe. 